So as I mentioned earlier, I'd like to tell you about autonomous vehicles with superpowers. My favorite superhero is Flash, who can see, think, and move way faster than anybody else. We'll call these things autonomous super vehicles. I'd like to tell you first why they're so important. And unfortunately, I need to start on a sad note. Did you know that almost 40,000 people die in traffic accidents just in the United States every single year? That is 100 people every single day. And if you think about the whole world, the number of fatalities every year is more than a million people. Before I could complete this sentence, somebody somewhere died in a traffic accident. Before I can complete this talk, it'll be hundreds. There's some good news, however. You can see the graph. It shows about a century of the introduction of the affordable car. And within this century, the number of fatalities per year stayed about constant. But the good news is that the number of fatalities per miles traveled actually decreased tremendously in the last few decades. You cannot see it in this graph because there's a huge increase in population and even more increase in the amount of miles traveled per person. The decrease in number of fatalities per miles traveled in the past few years is due to two things. One is a lot safer cars, but more importantly is the introduction and adoption of the seat belt. Now, frankly, we know that, or we estimate, that about half the fatalities that we face today in traffic accidents are those people who have not been protected by a seat belt. And as you can imagine, most of these accidents happen at very high speeds, typically 60 miles an hour or faster, sometimes 100 miles an hour. They happen so quickly that as you're driving, in one minute, everything is fine, and next minute, before you can blink, the accident is over already. In most cases, people cannot even comprehend what's happening. And in many other cases, they just don't have the motor skills. They want to go to the next lane, but they oversteer, go off the road, crash into a tree, and people die. So um, admittedly, there are a lot of cases where you know, there's people who get very, very, very lucky. So as many as fatalities there are on the road, there are many more that are near misses. And in fact, I should note that not this particular person, but there are people who are expert drivers, like race car drivers. If you were to put them in the seat and say, 10 seconds from now, something bad is going to really happen, and you have to fix it, they can probably fix many of the cases, if not all. In some of the research that we do, we ask the question, can we build technology that can operate vehicles faster, far faster, than humans possibly can. So obviously, doing this with full-size car is going to be very difficult if you want to experiment with things and so on. So we focus on another vehicle that expert humans can operate also very well and very fast. So we work with drones. Here on this video, you're seeing a drone traveling in a very complex environment, fitting through little openings coming very close to obstacles. This is piloted by a human who is obviously not on the drone, sitting somewhere else, and this camera image beamed back to a set of goggles worn by the human, and the human is driving it through this obstacle course. It is just amazing piloting that this human is putting in. So if you have a drone and you kind of flown it for, uh, for a few years, don't expect that you're going to get here. This is very, very difficult to achieve. So I know that you've been hearing all the time that AI is beating humans in chess, Go, your favorite video game, whatever you got. AI is beating everybody. Um, unfortunately for computers, AI is far, far from beating even the average driver, for, let alone the best ones, in real-world scenarios like this. So a couple of years ago, we decided that maybe we do a simulation challenge. This was a part of a bigger autonomous drone racing challenge called Alpha Pilot. There was a lot of, so we were advising this challenge. There was a lot of applicants. Uh, we had to quickly down select them. Uh, so our team here at MIT quickly formalized a simulation challenge. There's a simulated environment and a simulated drone. Teams have three months to develop their code that can autonomously navigate a simulated drone in the simulated environment. Um, we had 400 submissions. Here you're looking at the trajectories of 20 drones put on top of each other. You can see that they're navigating pretty good in just three months of code writing. They can reach up to 40 miles an hour. That's the top speed in this environment. And there's about 10 teams who've 
um, completed uh, five of the races that we've chosen. Obviously, there's a lot of crashes too. So this really um, kind of we thought that maybe we can build on this. Maybe we can build things that blend in simulation and reality so that we can develop drones in a, in a, in a faster way. Um, so we built these environments where we take a drone, put it into a motion capture room, get its position and orientation, render another image, and beam it back to the drone. Drone flies in an empty room, but hallucinates a completely different environment. We can even put a human into another room. A human and the drone can be in the same virtual space even though they're in a completely different physical rooms so that we can experiment with things in ultimate safety. Um, we decided that we need to build actually the imagery for the drone's eyes a lot better than this, so we even created a digital twin of two floors of this building. What you're looking at is not a cell phone video recording, but it is a real-time rendering of what is just outside of these doors. And this is built with tens of thousands of photograph imagery together with lots of laser scanning. Through this, we've realized that we will not be able to conquer this by just you know, putting together off-the-shelf pieces, building drones, and flying them. So we ended up building our own hardware, our own algorithms, and our own software all together all at the same time. One problem with off-the-shelf material is that it's mostly built for humans who we're trying to surpass. For example, if you go out and buy a camera, it captures 40 to 80 frames every second. That is because that's about what your eyes can see. If it were to capture a lot faster, it wouldn't matter if it was presented to you at the same rate. Um, but the problem is that you buy the camera that way, and the computers are designed for that camera. Algorithms are designed for that computer. Software is built for that algorithm. So if you try to use off-the-shelf components, you can't go too far. So we decided to build everything from the ground up. One of the first things that we did is we took a real-time capable computer put in it an inertial measurement unit that measures accelerations and turn rates. Uh, many of you here have smartphones. In every smartphone, we have one. We may have 1,000 IMUs in this room in various different devices. In your ears, you have an inertial measurement unit that allows you to balance. We even built optical odometers and put it right next to the motors, the propeller of the drone, and put lots of ticks around that motor so that we can very precisely measure how quickly that motor is turning. Now I'm going to show you a few results. Uh, so in the first video, we're going to have from the top right a drone starting. It's going to go through three gates, achieve 30 miles an hour very quickly, pass through one gate, and backflip through another gate to complete the turn. Um, here's how it looks like. If you look at an onboard camera, you start out, you go through very quickly, you have to break back, you need to notch through this gate so that you can flip through the other gate and complete your turn. So now we tried, now that we have autonomous drones, we tried to build a chase vehicle so that we can film this thing better. It is not very easy to chase this, so we start out, we try to chase it, we lose it, it flies away, we can see it notch through, we can film its flip, and then we can see it complete the turn. So I said flip so many times, but in case you missed it, here's the flip. It happens very quickly. Um, here's the same flip in about 20 times slow motion. Take a look at this. You can see the propellers turning. You can see everything happening in slow motion. Imagine your car being able to see this slow, the whole environment, so that it can make decisions on its own. So now in preparing this video, we cheated a little bit. There's a motion capture system. You can actually see it's light blinking if you look through the gate. That motion capture system captures the position of the drone 360 times every second and sends it back to the drone itself so that the drone can know roughly where it is. Uh, so don't get me wrong. With that motion capture system alone, you can't fly this fast. You still need the kind of hardware and the algorithms that I presented a second ago. But what we did next is that we actually started building the cameras that can do the same for us without the motion capture. So we have high-speed cameras that capture images at 400 frames a second. That's about 10 times faster than your eyes. So they can see things in 10 times slow motion. We put them in a stereo configuration, much like your eyes. We add a very precise inertial measurement unit in the middle, which you have in your ear. So it's replicating what you have, but much more precise and much faster. So now that is generating data at such a fast rate that you can't just put it into your typical embedded computers. So what we built is a circuit board that includes a device called a field programmable gate array that basically allows us to build our own specialized computer, etch that in so that we can process the data as it's coming in, 
extract the key information and pass it back to a traditional computer. So then we can do the similar experiments, reach about you know, within 10% of what I showed before and complete the turn as well. And so this, by the way, doesn't involve any kind of help from outside. Everything, every kind of sensing and computing is completely done on a very small drone doing all these tasks. So in closing, um, I'd like to show you this video, and I'd like to tell you that you know, it's not just these kinds of consumer-like quadcopter drones that we can do this with, but we can even put them into fixed-wing aircraft, much like the airplanes that you ride. We can flip them around. We can have them cooperate, do certain things together, uh, working together. Um, and beyond drones, we believe that this kind of technology can embody cars to make roads much safer. We think that this can be something like a seatbelt 2.0. It can actually reduce accidents, maybe eliminate them altogether. It can embody drones like this to empower search and rescue missions. It can even be powerful in things like space missions, for example, in a sample return from an asteroid where the grab and go happens so fast that you need technology like this. And I'm lucky to be here at MIT working with an amazing set of students and researchers who are equipping autonomous vehicles with superpowers. Thank you. <laughs>